What has a child done wrong that they have to repeat kindergarten or first grade? I mean, I would say our society, our families uh, have failed the children. They haven't failed. We still have huge numbers of third graders who fail the third grade reading exam. By third grade, they're already behind. They decide how many prison cells they need based on third and fifth grade math scores. By the age of five, somewhere between 85-90% of the brain is fully developed and there is no going back. The challenges are different now. Kindergarten doesn't look like it looked 10 or 12 years ago. This is not the Ozzie and Harriet world of the 1950s. I want for every one of these kids the same thing you want for your children. It took me six months to be able to find good quality care that I was comfortable with. I think we have a real issue in terms of both um, affordability and availability. Our children are our biggest asset. They could also be our biggest liability if we're not careful. that I can um, sit on? Is, that, you, is this one? Can I sit on this chair? Yeah, get out! Oh. Okay, I'm going to ask you a very important question. So think about this question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Here, raise your hand. Raise your hand and I'll call on you. Raise your hand and I'll call on you. Me. What, what do you want to be when you I'm going to be a police helicopter driver and I'll drive a helicopter and save people and put the bad guys in jail. Well, you're glad. Wow, now that is so great. What do you want to be? A president, like George Bush. You want to be president? Now that's great. How about you? What do you want to be? A firefighter. A firefighter. That's great. If you go into a kindergarten class, you basically see in virtually every kid the same level of excitement about being, being there. You know, excitement and joy in learning, joy in being with others, uh, the, 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 how fun it is to absorb new things. But by the time you get to about third or fourth grade, you already see that there are some kids in the class who really have that excitement and you already see a group of kids who kind of have already absorbed the message you know I'm not very good at this I don't you know I'm not getting the good grades that my classmates are getting maybe there maybe you know there's something wrong with me or I'm not supposed to be doing well with this kind of stuff never heard a four-year-old say I want to grow up to be a dropout what do you want to be when you grow up? a fire fire people said to children how do you picture yourself and they threw themselves as doctors and nurses and teachers and scientists and presidents and walking on the moon. Their dreams are there. We've got to give them, we being everybody, the foundation they need to get there. If we don't, we have failed them. And in turn, we failed ourselves. Okay, honey, what do you want to be when you grow up? A mommy. Oh. We are born with all of the nerve cells we're going to have during our life. The framework, the structure, the foundation, the roadmap call it what you want, is in place, wired together for all future learning, memory, and application of knowledge. 90% by age 5. The brain of the child is, think of it as being born, and the brain is sort of like a big, huge house. Half of those things in the house have already been wired. The electricity is there, they've been connected, but the switch has not been turned on. Not talking to a child, not holding a child, not providing them with what they need early on actually impacts brain development so that th those children are forever impacted by that experience, even if someone at age three picks them up and begins to love them. And what we do from birth, especially up to three years of age, by way of the stimulation within the environment, by way of the social connection, by way of the experiences, we truly individually turn on each one of those switches. If you're living in an environment, or if you're watching a lot of things on television that you aren't old enough to watch and understand that it's just for entertainment, it can begin to shape the minds and the thinking of our young children. You don't turn on those switches, then some of them actually lose the capability to be turned on, or they become much harder to turn on. That explains why children who start behind typically stay behind without a great deal of special ed and therapy. Shake your bean bag. Shake your bean bag. Shake your bean bag. Don't let it drop. Hold it.
We're really putting a lot of focus and emphasis on the first five years of life, really wanting to make sure that more four-year-olds have access to a high-quality preschool experience, as well as a great deal more parent education, more home visitation programs, more emphasis on quality of child care. A lot of parents don't realize the importance of preschool, regardless of their economic background. Uh, high income, low income, middle income, don't realize that preschool is an important part of uh, learning to be uh, to be prepared for education. How is that? There's a tremendous amount of child care out there. Unfortunately, the data tells us that if it isn't of a certain quality child care, it's not going to have the impact that it should have. Quality is so important and yet people don't understand maybe what it is that makes a program higher quality than another. The first thing is you have to have caring individuals. You have to have people that want to work with children. They have to be knowledgeable about early childhood development. A quality preschool would be one that has a lot of literacy. Education that gets kids really drenched in words and, and pre-reading activities. Age appropriate, that they're hands-on, that the children are having fun, that they, they do learn through play. They don't know why they're learning, but they love learning. They love new things and they even like little challenges at that age. It's so important that the environment is a good environment, is a positive environment, is an academic, is an educational environment, is a wholesome environment, so that our kids will grow up to be just very kind citizens and practice good citizenship. Quality child care for me is a place that I can take my children. It's a, it's a support system for me and for my family. Well, first of all, parents need to look at programs and ask questions. Look at their schedules, look at what they're eating, um, look at the interactions between the children and the adults. If the adults are down and on the children's level, then you know that they understand that this is where this child is doing their learning. Uh, if it's infants and toddlers and the, and the caregivers are on the floor and babies are having tummy time, then you know they understand where they need to be. Washing hands with singing ABCs, changing diapers with communicating, giving them those eye-to-eye -eye signals so they're learning, look in your eyes when you communicate. Charles is sad and then a parent is sad. Charles is happy in the morning, a parent is going to be have a great day all day at work. So try not to comfort the child first and as well as a parent and that makes their great day. Early child care providers bring a lot of heart to their work. And our goal has been to increase their uh, capacity to provide really quality care. Finding quality early care and education is very difficult. It took me six months to be able to find good quality care that I was comfortable with, that I felt that I could go to work every day and know that he was going to be well taken care of. When I was seven months pregnant, I went out one Saturday and I went to 12 centers actually and just based my search on location as well as um, their playground, what their playground looked like, like developmentally appropriate toys, etc. And out of those 12, I eliminated them all, sad to say. I know people who wouldn't put their dogs in some of the places that we ask our parents to put their children. Uh, you know, some of the kennels in our area are nicer than some of our daycares. Early childhood education, child care workers are some of the lowest paid employees, um, and yet we expect them to have incredibly high skills. To work with a, a classroom of three-year-olds <laughs> requires a great deal of skill in terms of classroom management, understanding child development, and so on. So if we're going to ask those folks to really provide a high quality environment, then we need to compensate them appropriately for the, the necessary skills and education that they should have. In the state of Virginia, the child care workers make less than zookeepers, which is kind of interesting if, if you compare what each has, is responsible for. One is really the future of our commonwealth, the future of our area here, both our economic vitality as well as those that are going to be our doctors, nurses, you know, lawyers, um, professional people when we are growing older.
we're paying them less than we pay zookeepers. We cannot touch the real stove, can we? What will happen if we do? What will happen? Burn! So we don't want to touch that, do we? I think we have a real issue in terms of both um, affordability and availability. And when I say availability, I'm talking about not just a place for a child to receive babysitting, but where a child can receive really stimulating early educational experiences. Do you think all those people can fit in those cars? Yeah. Affordable child care is a real issue that um, parents can't pay the high rates that it costs to provide care for children and so they're compromising not because they want to but because that's all they have that's all they can afford there's a huge gap between um, those who are uh, low income who may qualify for for initiatives like Head Start or Virginia Preschool Initiative and those who are in the middle class who really aren't looking for a free at least from my perspective I don't know that the middle class is really looking for a free education but we're looking for an affordable education. It's a very challenging thing for parents to be able to access it and be able to afford it. Uh, you know, I can tell you I pay $16,000 a year for um, early care and education for a four-year-old and an 11-month-old. The biggest challenge that we face would be turning families away that don't meet the income requirements that are currently in place. And there was an uh, interesting letter written to the editor um, just last week and a mother was lamenting the fact that the teacher said her child was behind the other children in kindergarten and she said well he's not had pre-k and the teacher said that's right and we're, we're, we've changed the curriculum in kindergarten quite a bit and if a child hasn't had pre-k experiences they're going to be disadvantaged and she didn't qualify because she makes more money than those families that qualify so income should not be a deterrent funding is the biggest challenge. To have quality, affordable child care, it does take a lot, and unfortunately, government is cutting back. Two of the staff members have taken a class that I have been teaching on training child care assistants, which you know provided extra information for them with activities and suggestions and providing background information as to why we do the activities that are done in a preschool classroom. So I was feeling really great about the progress and then Christina told me about what's going on with the funding and the struggles that they're under and that the doors will close on Friday. Seeing the kids run up to me that day, Miss Chris, Miss Chris, excited about the new day that they're getting ready to walk into and in the back of my mind is that the child care center is closing. And to greet those parents that afternoon to pick up their children with that information was really heartbreaking, not only for the parent but for us and the children. Ultimately funding would solve the issue of space because we could add additions, we could rent space, we could certainly go out and hire teachers. We want highly qualified teachers and we want teachers that have a degree in early childhood education. Early childhood is a long-term issue that, that Virginia needs a 10-year plan that would be followed regardless of changes in administration. And so I think it, that there are some really forward-thinking and visionary legislators in Virginia, and I, my hope is that they'll be able to kind of bring, bring that along in the legislature. In Virginia, between the grades of kindergarten and third grade, approximately 10,000 children a year repeat a grade. And because the public school system, you know, it costs about seven or eight thousand dollars per year per child for education, it really begins to look at like seventy or eighty million dollars a year spent on grades repeated. Children show up and, uh, to kindergarten and they're not school ready. Uh, immediately that puts a burden on kindergarten teachers because many of the children are school ready and then they have some who aren't and they're in the same classroom. Put yourself in the position of a teacher, what do you do? That's, that's, that's a real challenge. Because children are, are at home and they're not getting education, their parents are sitting in front of TV and they're lacking in social skills, they're lacking in developmental skills because they're not exercising and that t kindergarten teacher has to make up for all that plus do her job or his job. So much happens, I mean almost frighteningly so, in those early years. Now some of us, maybe we just lucked out. <laughs> um, but, but, but what about those 
who weren't fortunate enough to have that lock. What about them? We need to understand that children in poverty are under a lot of stress, children divorced, children who are yelled at, children who are mistreated cannot learn. When a child is under attack, under stress, there's a release of cortisol. When there's a release of cortisol and then adrenaline, it is chemically impossible for brain cells, remember the job of the brain is to memorize information and to apply it. It is chemically impossible when there is cortisol in the brain for brain cells to absorb new information. So a child who is living with stress and fear cannot learn until the sense of safety and love has been returned back to that child. I had a real epiphany with the case that I prosecuted now quite a number of years ago. I had a small child in, a, in one of my classrooms. He was four years old. We had a little girl last year who, um, when she came to us, her father was in prison. In 1994, a Hampton police officer named Kenny Wallace was shot to death. He was murdered one night while he was on duty by three people, one an adult and two teenagers. And the evidence showed in that case that the 14-year-old stood over Officer Wallace as he was dying after having already been shot by the adult, stood over him, emptied his gun into the car, and laughed. One day I documented whips on his back, going, and then the next day I documented cigarette burns on his hands. And at, immediately had to call CPS, immediately. I had no choice. Her mother had abandoned her on drugs with a drug problem. Uh, she had not uh, developed any relationships with peers or with adults. Uh, she was very violent and out of control when we got her. She had been molested. His mother was a crack addict who was not much older than he was. I mean, she was not much more than a child herself. She was a prostitute. She prostituted herself to feed her addiction. And he lived with her in his early, earliest years and witnessed beatings by her customers, um, was himself sold for drugs, and essentially had no one, no one, no guidance, no assistance, no love, no caring, no nothing. This child happened to be a child of a migrant family. So as soon as CPS stepped on that door, he disappeared. I never saw him again. It just brought home to me in a really horrific way what happens to these kids who are throwaways. They're going to end up in the system at some point. And at 14, you know, that young man, there wasn't much, much left for him. I really wanted to reach that family. And, and maybe give the parents some strategies on how to deal with this four-year-old, but he was gone, just like that. One doesn't like to ever think there's no redemption for anybody, but I don't see much opportunity for him. But it's because of where he came from that he turned out that way. I don't know where this child will be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, but in my head and in my heart, I do believe we've made a difference. And I think many, many children are in situations that they can't help themselves. And yet, if we're there for them, we are going to make a difference. I grew up the, the youngest of seven children in York County. And uh, when we were children, we would sometimes go on picnics to the battlefields down there. Now, I'm a lot younger than my siblings, about seven years younger than my youngest brother. And uh, one day we were all kind of climbing around on the battlefields down there. And uh, my mom had laid out a spread of food for us. And, and my mom's going, all right, come eat, come eat. And so, you know, seven kids, we all look at each other. It's a foot race to get to the food. And so everybody takes off running. And I'm clearly lagging behind in the tall grass, being that much younger than everyone else. And my father, who built a little bit like me, which is not for speed, looks back and sees that I'm falling behind. Now, I'm sure he was hungry too, and he could have run on ahead of and, and gotten to the food, but instead he reached his hand back and took my hand in his and pulled me along faster than I ever could have uh, by myself gotten across that field. And, and so got me to the food, and, and we all shared in the picnic. And, and that's sort of the situation we find ourselves uh, with children, which is, uh, are we so concerned with getting to the picnic, of getting to our prize at the end, that we don't have time to look back and see that there's a small child falling behind us? 
uh, and just a little bit of effort of putting our hands back and slowing our pace down just a little bit and making that sacrifice can pull a child along and get them somewhere they never would have gotten to or get them there more quickly than they ever would have on their own. Our job is not to shield the child from the world and its diamonds and rust, but rather to equip the child with the resolve and the fortitude and the strength and mindset to carry on and do good and do well despite it all. I want to be a firefighter, peace and man, a doctor, top of the tree, a football player, I want to be a police girl, a doctor, a super top. When I was 12 years old and I was asked what I wanted to be, I basically said I wanted to save the world. I really thought that was the, you know, possible, that we could change everything. And I feel that excited about what's happening in Virginia right now. It is possible for us to change Virginia's world for young children in six years. I tell you what, I may not be able to save the world, but we'll save a lot of kids here in Norfolk, I can tell you that. Ten years down the road, I'd like to see teachers better trained, teachers better paid, teachers better compensated with benefits. <laughs> You know, but that's that's a dream. We're hoping for utopia here, right? <laughs> Economists have really been um, great advocates for investing in early childhood because they have been the ones to say that in terms of economic development, they have a hard time finding any better investment. Where do you get the bigger bang for the buck? Putting educational dollars in a child from age four to five or age 17 to 18? Business leaders play an important role in the whole issue around early childhood development and children in general. For me to have a motivated, productive group of associates working at Capital One, they need to have their issues around how to raise their children and know that their children are well cared for. As a business leader, if I can invest in what's the right answer for their children, then I'm investing in keeping them in my workforce as well, and we're in a virtuous cycle. A one dollar investment in high quality early care and education can yield a 16 percent compounded annual inflation adjusted rate of return just on that investment there are that many factors that are impacted long term in the high quality early care and education and that is a number that is lower retention rates higher graduation rates less use of public welfare less teen pregnancy less drug abuse um, higher incomes um, lower incarceration rates. The data is phenomenal in, in the, the breadth of the impact that high quality early care and education can have. So not only are they focused on their future workforce and making sure that we maximize the number of highly skilled workers, they're saying, well, we know for our current workforce, high quality care and, and finding um, accessible and affordable high quality care is a big issue for our current workforce. The payoff is not immediate, um, and so it's a long-term investment, and, it's some, and sometimes it's difficult to convince people to be patient and to look for the long-term outcome, um, that you're not going to see a benefit overnight. For every child we spend a dollar on at the elementary and high school age, we spend four cents on a toddler uh, in state and federal funds. Well, yeah, you don't want to just throw money to solve a problem, but throwing no money at it certainly is not going to help the problem either. I mean, you, you're going to pay the money up front or you're going to pay the money later. And if you pay the money later, which is when they're in the juvenile justice system or the adult criminal system, you're going to pay a lot more money than you're going to pay at the front end. We've all heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. But that's really the truth when we look at the, the issues around early childhood education. No one group or organization can solve the, the problems. We can't expect the school divisions to be the, or the group that solves the early childhood problems. We can't expect the government to take it on. It has to be a public-private partnership. You might just ask yourself, you know, what is it that I can do to make sure that our children in this community start off from the earliest days of life geared for success, that it'll benefit them and it'll benefit the whole area and the whole Commonwealth. Being a father of a preschool child, I'd like to say to parents out there that you need to get active. We need to begin to ask the hard questions of our policymakers, and we've got to start demanding early care and education for our youngest citizens. That early education, that early learning, 
is essential to turn on those switches for all that those children have been born with in their brains. They are born ready to learn. And we within the community have the opportunity to provide those experiences and stimulations. Read, 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 read to your children. Make sure that you have books, 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 books in your home. And also, let your children see you reading. If we invest in children now, we won't lose another generation. There's a lot at stake for all of us, whether we're parents or not. And, and so I would encourage people to continue to educate themselves, to talk about this. And when I meet with groups, so what I say is, you know, you keep talking about it and public awareness is going to grow. And those parents that haven't yet gotten the message about the importance of early childhood education uh, will hear about it and they'll start seeking the opportunities. This is the way we do it in a democracy. We prefer our children's future to our present. I would argue that's fundamental to our sense of democracy. Investment in human capital, that's the secret. That's the secret of the American experiment. And our investment in the early childhood care and education of our very, very youngest citizens is the thing that will save our country. Thank you.